Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and I'm here today with, Brian, with Ryan Boma, and he is the designer of the Elusive 1099 from the DIY Sound Group project. And I reached out to Ryan because I tested this speaker recently, and rather than me doing the whole review and guessing as to what was going on, I thought, why not just go to the source and ask the guy directly? And Ryan said, yeah, man, I'll be happy to happy to join you on and, and talk about the design. So uh, first of all, thank you, Ryan, for, for joining me and being willing to come on here and share some of your trader secrets about your speaker. Yeah, no secrets in this one. It's all out there for everybody. So, but That's thanks right. for having me. Yeah, absolutely, dude. I, I, uh, I think it's good to kind of get some perspective on, you know, what went into the design because, you know, I measured the speaker and we both understand that it's not completely flat but there's certain trade-offs. I mean, you look at the whole kit and it's, it's about what, 500 bucks per speaker um, ballpark. And you get, it's over my shoulder here. So you get two 10 inch woofers, the COs, uh, wave guy, compression driver, and then two mid ranges. Gosh, this whole left, right thing drives me nuts. Two <laughs> mid ranges. You get all that for about 500 bucks. And I'm thinking like, I'll be honest with you. I didn't know what to expect. I kind of figured it was going to be pretty sloppy. I mean, I had a lot of people actually comment on, I'm curious to see what the two mid ranges do. And, the design turned out measure was uh, really, really good. And do these things hammer? I mean, I, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I set up in my living room. I was like four meters away and I pegged the volume at 110 decibels and I had hearing protection on and it was still like, that's it's loud. Still too, it's still too loud. <laughs> like, that's very loud. Yeah. And there's no telling how much louder they could go because that was as loud as I was willing to take it. The woofers, I was actually watching them to make sure they weren't, you know, going to bottom out and do they, I mean, I, I don't know how much louder it could have gone, but it definitely could have gone louder. I just, there's no way I would want to listen to it any louder than that. Yeah. I think most people will run out of subwoofer capabilities far before they run out of speaker capabilities with this one. Yeah. And that that's very, very true. And that's something that I kind of failed to mention, but it's been in the back of my head when I posted the review, you know, a lot of people were talking about they want high SPL capabilities. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, what subwoofers? I mean, you probably would need to run, like four fifteens or something, you know, and maybe even run pro audio 21 inch drivers or something for subwoofers. I mean, there's a lot of well, SPL out of these. Yeah. I know like back when these were designed, you hung out more on the car audio forums and I was more on AVS form. Yeah. And, um, you know, I kind of followed what you were doing a little bit, but I'm not, I'm not sure what kind of the, the MO was at that time for you, but around AVS form, a lot of guys were running, like eight eighteens was not out uncommon. Yeah. And <laughs> and crazy. and they wanted a speaker that could, you know, hang with that. So um that was one of the big uh motivators for designing this speaker. Yeah, well that makes a lot of sense. And and matter of fact, I forgot to mention this, but uh you have your own YouTube channel, Impulse Audio. And the the funny thing about this is I've been subscribed, I found your channel last summer sometime. And I thought, man, this guy's channel is awesome. Like you do measurements, you talk about DIY. I was like, how do I not know about this? And I've also known you as Tuxedo Civic from AVS since I don't know how long you've been on there, but for as long as I can remember going on AVS forum, I remember you from there, but yep. I didn't sync those two up until last week. And, and the, only oh. reason I, the only reason I found that out is because I, I've never seen your face before. I just seen your little avatar and it's like this, it's this big, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was trying to find out what the primary axis, uh, the, what the reference axis was for the 1099s. So when I Googled it, I found some something that was affiliated to you and it said, you know, uh, of Impulse Audio. And I thought, is that, is that the same guy? You know, and it's all yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, I think you, I think I verified it with you on Facebook a couple of days ago. I was like, well, that's, that's pretty dang cool. So I do want to say that I really love your channel. Um, I noticed you haven't been posting a lot of content lately. You've you got some stuff going on. You want to mention that real fast? Yeah, I get a lot of people on my Instagram or my YouTube channel commenting, hey, where are you? You know, we need another video. And because I was putting them out, like I'm not, I, I'm, I'm never going to be a YouTube channel where you get a regular, you know, once a week video or, you know, every second Saturday I do a vlog or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I was putting out videos about once a month. And then we started a pretty significant addition to our house probably added 40% more square footage and a whole bunch of changes to the roof lines and stuff. And we started that last February and then COVID hit in March. Mm. 
So I have not, I, I was having a real problem finding sub trades. Mm -hmm. um, so I've ended up doing pretty much everything on my own, except mm -hmm. for electrical. So I've been just, you know, buried up to my eyeballs in this stuff for over a year. And yeah. the YouTube channel, it didn't get any attention. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can understand that. Yeah. Well, you said, like well, that's good. Yeah. You seem like a handy guy. So I don't doubt that you're probably doing a good job on your own, with your own house and saving some money <laughs> in the process. It's just a slow job. Yeah. Saving some money, but very but sometimes, slowly. Sometimes you'd rather just pay somebody to have it done and, and not worry about it. There was a few things that I would have preferred <laughs> to do that. <laughs> like yeah. the roof. <laughs> oh, dude, there's no way. There's no way I would get on a roof. We we built one of our houses and uh, I, we did a lot of the stuff ourselves. And just the tile, that killed my back, man. I'll, I'll never yeah. do tile again. And I don't think I'll ever build my own fence again either. That was terrible. So I, I can kind of feel your pain, but there's no way I would get on a roof to do any of that. I'd be scared to death. <laughs> it was it was brutal. I bet, but man. I didn't have much options. Yeah. Well, um, if you don't mind, maybe we can kind of talk about you know, maybe a little bit of your past, how you got into DIY, and then we can kind of jump over into the 1099 and maybe other things that you've designed or, or plan to maybe get into when you have some more free time, if that happens in the future. Sure. Yeah. I don't know how far you want me to go back, but, uh, birth, you know, um, what's that birth. <laughs> birth. <laughs> well, you can always chop it out later, right? If something's yeah. no good, just cut it out later. <laughs> right. Right. But you know, like when I was in high school, I was a typical kid with a new car and wanted to be cool with it. So I, I did speaker stuff mm -hmm. um, in my car. And then when I went off to college in engineering, I started learning about um, what a sound wave was and um, what, you know, phase was and how waves could cancel each other out and the length of a wave determined its frequency and things like that. And I, I kept thinking about my car audio crap and, and um it started to click and then when i left college and stuff i was more interested in my own speakers in my house uh but i was broke right out of college and everything so i cobbled together a diy design that probably was terrible i didn't follow all the right rules and everything you know that you're supposed to follow but i had a lot of fun with it and it's just grown from there i've just done more and more of it learned lots on the internet um you know read a few of the books, um, but not all of them. And, um, you know, eventually just got better and better at it. And then I got really interested in waveguides with dome tweeters because I saw a lot of benefits to being able to cross lower and uh, reduce distortion and stuff. It's actually Zaf Audio. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, yeah. You must know Zaf. Yeah, everybody oh, yeah, knows yeah. Um, I don't know where he is now, but I wish he was still around doing Probably things. Probably riding a bike somewhere. Yeah, yeah, he's on a bike. He held a picture on a bike, and that was, how long ago was that? That's got to be like eight or nine or maybe even ten years. Yeah. Yeah, he just got on his road bike and left. Yeah, and, um, he's like, see y'all later. But at least he left his site up. Yes, and yeah. I learned a ton from his site, an absolute ton. And he did a little bit... Um, a little bit with SB29 tweeters and waveguides. And I just thought, wow, there's a lot to be gained from this. So I actually bought the same components he was testing and started testing them myself and playing with them. And then around that time, the guys on AVS were really developing the CEOs thing. I didn't have really anything to do with the development other than just kind of watching their chit chat and throwing my two cents in once in a while. And uh, when it came out, I, I asked Eric for a couple samples and put together a few crappy things and and he said well hey you know do do a few things and tell me uh what you like and maybe we can put a kit on the site so i did this thing with um the same woofer from the 1099 and a co's 12 i think maybe the 10 and that went on as a kit and whatever people enjoyed it and then it was around that time where people were asking for a very specific speaker and eric and i were bouncing around this idea of what became the 1099. Um, and then I started a YouTube channel and blah, blah, blah. And now you're a celebrity. <laughs> no, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. That's a, that's a good, uh, that's a good way of looking at things. Oh, you mentioned the engineering uh, background. So what do you have a degree in engineering then or? 
Yeah, civil engineering. So it's okay. not like electrical or acoustical engineering or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, I understand. Okay. But in those first two or three years, um, you know, you, you're taking lots of courses, lots of physics. Yeah. Um, the, right. the physics classes are really what got me the background that I needed. Yeah. Yeah, that's, well, that's good. I think, um, you know, you've got the, the understanding at a, at a roots, a grassroots level, I guess, yeah. so to speak. Um, so that's cool. I, and I didn't know that. I was, when you said engineering, I was like, you probably got like a electrical engineering degree or something crazy. No. Yeah. No. Well, we can dream, right? <laughs> <laughs> those electrical engineers are different. The physics guys, those are the, those are the ones that are a different league. <laughs> yeah, physics. So maybe I should have gone down that path. I'm... Yeah. Yeah. Well, me too. I don't think I could have hang or could have hung. Yeah. I don't think I could have hung in that, man. I do plan on um, coming back onto the YouTube channel here shortly. In fact, I've started filming a video about ceiling speakers. So, um, ceiling speakers. Look up for that. For, uh, for like the addition. In, us... in the... Yeah. What kind of ceiling okay, speakers? Okay. Yeah. For... You can't bait us like that. Sorry. What kind of ceiling speakers? <laughs> so, yeah, ceiling speakers up in the addition. Um, <laughs> I was looking at using the those um, SB Acoustics coaxials that came out yeah. a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. The the, um, the more like budget friendly ones, I think. Yeah, oh, they're like forty bucks a pop yeah, or something. Yeah, I think they're like gonna... fifty or something. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. yeah, so I was gonna use those and do a little ceiling project for people, and. <sighs> just the more and more I thought about it, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. There's times when DIY just doesn't make sense. So I actually bought some clipped ceiling speakers from Best Buy on sale for like, yeah, I know. <laughs> they're, How dare you, I'm getting sir. there. I'm getting, okay, right. So I bought them. They're like $70 each. So I actually paid more, but they have the bezel and the little knobs to turn and mount them in the ceiling, they just make life so easy. And we're talking about I get it. our kitchen where we're just gonna have a little bit of background music. Right, okay, yeah. So I, that thought, makes I sense. don't need fidelity here. And then, so I start the camera, I'm like, okay, I, I did this sinful thing here. I bought these clip speakers. <laughs> we're gonna open these up and take a look at them. And I haven't like really tested them yet or listened to them at all but I can already tell they're crap. Like they're, they're so <laughs> basic. They just have one tiny little capacitor on the tweeter and there's nothing else. So I might actually turn it into a video or a series where I kind of modify them and try to make them good. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, sometimes it's easier just to go with a, a package, you know, like everybody hates on sound bars and I've never owned one, but I was curious to see, you know, what sound bars measure like, you know, what their radiation pattern is and stuff. So I've ordered, three different ones recently. One's a Bose, a Vizio combo setup with like a subwoofer and a Sonos beam, I think. And I got to tell you, man, that Vizio with a little subwoofer, it's nice. Like I get why people go for sound bars. It's just over a, over a regular TV speaker. I'm like, this is nice. And it was 250 for everything, you know, the sound bar, the wireless speaker, you know, all the stuff behind you. So yeah, so 250 bucks and you plug it in and it's convenient and it works and it yeah. looks okay. You know, it's not like spray painted or something. It's... Yeah. <laughs> and you're not getting MDF in your nose exactly. for three days. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so going back to the 1099s, um, you know, I was curious if you could talk maybe about some. So when you build a speaker like this, a big behemoth and it's got multiple drivers, you know that there's going to be compromises, but you also have a goal that you're trying to get to. Um, so if you don't mind, maybe talk about what you're, I don't know what your design process was there, you know, maybe the, the different iterations you went through, what your goals were, what known compromises you made. Just, I'm just curious. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, I, um, I'm thankful that you're asking what the goals were because I think a lot of DIY guys, they'll say, Hey, I want to make a, a really great sounding speaker. And I always think to myself, well, is that your only goal to make a great sounding speaker? Mm. Um, there's, there's usually more, maybe it's my engineering background, but there's usually more constraint on the design than just make it sound good. Right. Um, size is a, is usually a goal. You know, someone's got a specific size in mind. Budget is obviously a goal. So 
we did have a size limitation in mind, but mostly a configuration in mind. So it had to fit comfortably under somebody's screen. Um, again, this was in an era on AVS form where people, some people were running AT screens, but not everybody was, and they didn't have a good speaker that was high output that they could actually fit under a screen. So that's where we figured, okay, it needs to be a three way where you can flip the mids and tweeter. And it, we kind of had this idea of 12, 13 inch box that would fit under a screen. So that was probably the primary goal. Um, the next was super high sensitivity. People um, wanted very high output for those dynamics. Right. Um, so pro, pro woofers and everything else was um, on the table. But the problem I ran into with that goal was the mid range. There are very few mid ranges when you put a compression tweeter horn driver over top of a mid range and try to fit that in a 13 inch box, you do not have very many options. And if one four inch driver has a radiation pattern that doesn't work with the horn and side by side woofers. So that's where we came up with this idea of using two woofer, two mid range, because you uh, add three dB to your efficiency, um, six dB to your sensitivity in this case. And, um, and it also does something very unique to the radiation pattern. So that's where this funky two mid range thing comes into play and how we got there. Um, a lot of people ask about that and they wonder how that can possibly sound good and how it works and everything else. Um, that yeah. was, and I'll, and I'll say that that was one of my concerns, like I mentioned previously, was that, you know, you look at it, you think, okay, well, there's definitely going to be some kind of lobing, combing effects going on in the crossover region. And they actually do pretty darn well. And I, I do really like the fact that you've done the woofer at the top and the bottom. Um, and the reason I say that is because as I'm starting to test more and more speakers and, and listen to more and more speakers, one thing I'm really starting to notice is that um, when the woofers are stacked, like they're arrayed up, like over here, when the woofers are arrayed up, you know, all in a row, from top to in the middle of the speaker, and then they have the tweeter or whatever at the, at the top of that, you can often hear the sound being pulled to the woofers. You know, like there's some kind of issue going on, lobing or something maybe going on, but you can actually hear like the, like the mid range being pulled toward the woofers and there's a split in the sound stage height. And it's just really weird. Um, I think when you have something like this, you don't have that, you know what I mean? Cause the acoustic center is, is I guess a bit more broadened, so to speak. It's bigger and the other thing that it does that again on AVS form, all the chatter was kind of, there was a, a big push around deadening theater rooms, like like really deadening them to, to nothingness. Um, oh, yeah. diffusion, diffusion wasn't so popular back then. People wanted the room to be super silent. And I guess that kind of works for theater. Um, and what happens when you put the two woofers like that, a lot of theater rooms, well, any room struggles with um, uh, room interaction in around three, 400 Hertz. Right. Is it an Allison effect? Yeah. 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 Well, the, yeah, the Allison effect is usually referred to when you're talking about a rear wall reflection, mm -hmm. I think, if I have that right. But when you, when you stack the woofers like that, the, the ceiling and floor reflections can often be canceled out. Right. And uh, a lot of people really object to the ceiling reflections for home theater, especially now that we're using overhead surrounds and, and Atmos and things like that. We don't want any reflections from a different speaker other than those speakers on the ceiling. Oh, that's, right? a good, that's a really good point. I hadn't even considered that in, in terms of home theater and Atmos and having that sound emanating from above you and, and getting that reflection from, you know, horizontally placed speakers. So that's, that's a good point. Yeah, and then floors are notoriously hard to well, ceilings as well, but they're they're hard to treat. You can't right, you know, put a sound, sound panel on your floor. You can right. on your ceiling, but uh, definitely not on your floor. So right. people usually and it, use carpet. And if it were, it had to be pretty thick too to capture, you know, the two three hundred hertz region as well. Exactly. Yeah. So this is a way to kind of combat that. That was 
that was very much a secondary design choice. Um, and some people have moved that top woofer to the bottom. And I get asked about that a lot. Hey, can I move the, the two woofers to the bottom? Yeah, sure. Fill your boots. I mean, it's, the if that's your preference, go for it. Yeah, I'm curious why they would want to do that, though. Maybe it's just trying to, to move the the height of the speaker, the center line up maybe, or? Yeah, I think just trying to get the speaker not so tall and, you know, taking up so much space in the room, maybe right. um, lower the center of gravity on the speaker. Yeah. I never really envisioned too many people using these in a living room where kids are running around or anything, but I think <laughs> they've become so popular that people are putting them in their living rooms. Mm -hmm. So that's where you get that from. Yeah. Well, and the, the fellow who loaned them to me, uh, who I want to thank by the way, he lives like 30 minutes nearby. And matter of fact, he actually found me on AVS forum and he said, Hey, I saw you live, you know, nearby. Would you be interested in testing X, Y, Z? I've got all these speakers. And I was like, heck yeah. You know, cause otherwise where else was, was I going to get these and nobody's going to ship these to me unless I build them myself. <laughs> yeah. There's just no way. So, uh, but he had built some kind of like stands, I guess, for them to, to set them up on top of. And that's what I use for my, for my listening tests. But yeah, they are a bit, I don't know. I wouldn't want kids running around, running around them for sure. No, the form factor on these things were always intended for dedicated theaters where, yeah. you know, you weren't worried about them getting knocked over personally. I mean, I designed them and I think they look very ugly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they were in the living room, gl grills would be a must. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I could see that. So in a dedicated theater, who cares what they look like, especially yeah. if you put them behind a screen. Well, um, and, and that's the one thing too, is, you know, we, we talked about the high frequency kind of has a, a bump to it. So if I was listening to them or when I was listening to them, I was listening to them like as a stereo setup because that's what I'm familiar with. And that's kind of how I evaluate speakers objectively so I can compare with the measurements. Uh, but if you're putting them behind an AT screen, you know, there's the idea that the AT screen may knock some of that down. I don't know how much and ideally, I guess a good AT screen wouldn't do anything to the signal, but I think we both know that there aren't many uh, AT screens that will do that that job completely well unless you're spending a lot of money at least from what i've seen yeah definitely these were again going back to the design goals um the high frequencies were left a little high they're, they're it's pretty easy to take away high frequencies yeah right um but that was because people were so focused on sensitivity at the time um and avrs were getting really good at doing room correction and the mini DSP was becoming pretty widespread and people were doing their own room correction and their own uh, EQ to their speakers. And also dedicated theaters, people were kind of concerned about the whole audience. So because it's a constant directivity speaker, you'd be fanning that sound across potentially a pretty wide uh, group of people. Mm -hmm. So Keeping the response super, super flat, first of all, it would be very difficult to do passively with this speaker because it is it's so complex with the mid ranges right. where they are and everything. So I was never going to get this thing to be a pancake. Right. And some little warts were left in there because it was simply, we don't care. We're going to DSP this thing to death and get it the way we like it. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing too, is, I mean, if you try to actually make this flat for like a standard two channel stereo listening setup, yeah, you mentioned it would be tough to do. It would also be very expensive. You know, I can't imagine what that would do to the overall cost to do that when a few bands, like three or four bands of parametric EQ can do a lot of to the speaker to, to shore some of those things up. Yeah. Yeah. And even like, I'm still using an AVR from around that era, Yamaha that I think has 10 PEQs in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can adjust the Q, the frequency, um, and the level, not too fine of gran grain, um, mm -hmm. but I can, I can do that very easily right in the AVR. So, yeah. um, you know, to have this idea of having a speaker that's razor flat, um, I do that sometimes with designs and I still like a speaker that sounds that way, um, provided everything else is right with it, mm -hmm. but it just didn't seem necessary for this type of design. Yeah. Well, and that's, that is one reason why I reached out to you is because I wanted, I want people to understand that. I mean, 
as a reviewer, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a certain profile and response, but I understand that a lot of times that may not actually be the design, the end design goal. You know, there's, there's budget, there's size, or these other constraints that you want to achieve. And within that budget, you just simply cannot do that. You know, like we said before, 500 bucks for these, and then you build on whatever, you know, material or not material, but I don't know, wood glue is like three bucks a bottle. So $503 for one of these. Uh, that's, that's stupid, stupid low price. I mean, I just don't understand. I don't understand how anybody's even breaking even on these. I just don't, get <laughs> like, I don't know what the individual price is, but I'm just looking at it. Like that can't be, you know, how are you even breaking even? I think volume. Yeah. yeah I don't know his numbers. But... Yeah. yeah. But they are a, a pretty rocking speaker, man. I mean, one of the first things I did was I just cranked them. I was like, all right, let's, Let's see what they can actually do because they're supposed to get loud. <laughs> and I was like, "Good lord, this is ridiculous." That's what for. Yeah. Did you did you listen to them with uh, subwoofers? I wasn't sure when I read no, your review. No, no, I never did. I, so I try to evaluate everything on the same scale, you know, like across the board, uh, bookshelves, floor standards, all that stuff, because I, I don't want to. Once you start mixing and matching things, yeah, then somebody's going to say, "Well, why don't you do this for that?" And why don't you do this for that? You know. So it's just like, okay, well, let's. Look at them raw, you know, test them raw subjectively and, and then look at the data objectively and then see what you need to do. So my guess was, I think I said 80 to 100. I, I think I put 100 was a roll off on these, which, you know, I think a lot of people would be surprised. They say, oh, we got two tens, but they're high sensitivity tens, especially when you're yeah. able to get that output from them. I mean, I'm guessing just one of them is, is probably, um, what, 96 dB maybe sensitivity? I can't remember exactly. I mean, yeah. it's, it's got to be somewhere in that area because then you've, you know, you add another, so you get the 6 dB to help compensate for the babble step. And so I'm guessing it's probably in that area somewhere. I mean, you're just not going to have a 10 that plays down to 50 hertz with that kind no. of sensitivity. Matter of fact, the Klipsch, I tested the Klipsch Heresy 4s, and they're $3,000 a pair, and they have a 12, and they're ported. And I think, I don't remember the exact number, but I want to say, like, F3 is somewhere maybe 70 or 80 Hertz, you know, and yeah. I'm like I paid, you pay $3,000 a pair for these things. And they're not that the HTM V2 or the HTM 12 V2 that Matt Grant designed. I just finished wrapping that up on testing and listening to them. And I would recommend those any day of the week over those clips. And oh, cool. know, that's, that's probably, I don't know, five, five times the price of the, of, the clips is probably five times the price of that. So yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot going on, a lot of good going on in the DIY uh, community. And that's really why I want to kind of test these products and, and reach out to the designers and give you guys, you know, like, Hey, look what's going on over here. Yeah. You could spend this much money on a pre-built product, or you can take some time, do a little bit yourself, but have everything sent to you ready to go. And then you just assemble it and you can have a much better product for, I mean, even less than half the cost. Yeah. It's, it's just really impressive. And the thing, like, yeah. you guys were doing this stuff. I mean, yeah, I've got the clipple, you know, to measure stuff. But a lot of these, you and a lot of the other guys are doing this stuff with backyard measurements, which, man, I know how much of a pain that is. I mean, I've spent four days measuring a tower speaker, literally four days measuring a tower speaker to get 140 measurements to get full spin data on it. And it would take me a bare minimum of 10 hours to measure speakers before I got the near field scanner. So, I know how it is, man. It's it's and it's impressive to be able to build a speaker like you guys are doing, you know, with let's I mean archaic measurement well, methods. <laughs> Some... I, I feel so fortunate nowadays, you know. Yeah, I've spent an entire Saturday in my backyard making weird sounds. Oh yeah, but, I've seen um, your videos. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> but you know, like I was referring to back in college when I was learning about sine waves and st stuff like that. I had a crappy, super inaccurate SPL meter yeah. and a clipboard and a test CD that I would play a tone, write the level, play the next tone, write the level, right? Plot it out like so, in Excel or something? Yeah, well, <laughs> just I'd just do it by hand, record it, and then I forget if I plotted it up in some like Excel 98 or something like that. But, um, you know, I so I just feel super fortunate and luxurious to be able to use sound easy or home impulse or something like that. Cause it's one click of a button and boom, you got this great data. I know it. Yeah. It's, it's pretty awesome. I used to use sound easy when I first started measuring speaker, like drive units. And that's a great program. So is that what you still use primarily or do you, cause I know on your, on your videos, I see you use a sound easy. Yeah. You might want to cut this part out or not, but um, okay. a lot of, a lot of people ask me what I use and 
I use SoundEasy on YouTube because it's not free. And mm -hmm. I just don't know, like if I'm using Roo, if that's really appropriate or not. But when people ask me about it, I don't recommend SoundEasy. It's okay. a bit dated. Um, like I have no problems with you leaving this in, but I, I don't know if it's appropriate or not to oh, say. No, I'll leave it in if you don't mind. I mean, I think it's useful information for people. Yeah, I think it's like 200 bucks or 250 bucks or mm -hmm. something. And it just, I don't know if it, it feels like it was designed on Windows 3.1 and it, <laughs> yeah. it, it doesn't really, it's got a lot of power in it. I don't use most of the, the features because I just don't really find a use for them. Mm -hmm. um, I do like the box calculator. I forget the exact name they use for that in there, but it's like sound box or something like that. I, I like their box calculator a lot, much more than WinISD. Um, but yeah, I I just don't find sound easy to be worth it. If you're if you're looking to buy a microphone and some software and get into measuring speakers and maybe building a speaker, mm -hmm. just use Brew or Home Impulse. That's that's yeah. what I like, and they work. Uh, I've been using REW for a long time, and I remember I actually started out with True RTA. Uh, oh yeah, before I started using Roo, yeah, and then I remember when I switched or I tried Roo, I was like, man, this is so hard to do. But then, you know, I gave myself like a day and then I was like, oh, this is actually not too bad. And now I can't go back to anything else other than, you know, what I do for, for measuring for my website. But I use REW all the time, man. And it's, I can't believe that it's free, you know, yeah. at least the, the non-pro version is free. It's so good. Yeah, it really is. I, I'd like to have John on maybe sometime to, to just kind of pick his brain. Cause I can only imagine how smart that guy is to be able to do that. Like I, co I code stuff up a little bit for work and I, I make do, but I'm not great at it. And I'm just thinking like this guy's got tons of like thousands and thousands of users and hardly ever any fixes or bugs that he needs to implement. So he's probably on a different level. It's a very good piece of software and it's free. It's unbelievable. And this is what I mean. Like from the days of using an SPL meter and a clipboard to root for free, the only yeah. thing you need is a hundred dollar calibrated microphone and you're up and running. Yeah. It's incredible. No, oh, and the and the and then the mic's USB, so you don't even need like a separate USB sound card that you used to need back in oh. the day with an XLR mic. Now you just plug a USB mic in and you're good to go. Yeah, I thought I was in heaven when I had an XLR mic and I had a stupid phantom power and trying to get the thing to work and it wouldn't play with my computer and yeah. Oh, I remember. Yeah. I don't know if you ever had. I can't remember who made it, but I think it was like something called Ice, and it was a USB XLR adapter. Yep. And I remember having that thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm free. I don't have to carry this, you know, sound, yes. sound box around with me, lug it everywhere I go. I had one of those too. I kind of question how accurate it was, but yeah. I did have one of those. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it may not have been that accurate, but it worked. I was happy with it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So yeah. Um, what do you have? I mean, you mentioned you may do a video on the clip stuff. Do you have any other ideas or designs maybe that are kind of kicking around that you might bring out at some point that we should be getting excited about? Well, uh, sorry, but no, I, I just oh. got to get through this stupid renovation and get those ceiling speakers done. But I mm -hmm. think I can make some pretty fun videos with the ceiling speakers. Yeah. After that, I kind of need to get my home theater put back together. I might do sound panels, but I mean, there's probably a zillion videos about sound panels. So yeah. I, I don't know if I'll do one of those, but I'm going to make some for myself. Um, yeah, I have to give that some thought. I mean, I want to make some cool stuff. I've got some really nice drivers. Most of my test videos and stuff have been, you know, $50, $80 drivers here and there. Right. But I've got, um, I'm trying to think, I've got some illuminators, I think. Mm. Those I are some of really, my favorites. Yeah, I should really test those and use those in a design. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll go from you know, off the shelf cliffs, clip ceiling speakers to illuminators or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a, yeah. I mean, cause just one illuminator probably costs more than that pair of clip ceiling speakers. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love those illuminators, man. I've been using those for a long time. And I remember that I had them installed in my car system, like in 2010 and I was getting ready for a show, a car competition. And, um, I had taken the woofers out to do, to add some AP, some mat to my, my AP vario vent. And when I was installing the woofer, it slipped, the screwdriver slipped and it poked oh. a hole right through it. And I was out in the garage and I went, 
<gasps> and my wife came outside because she heard me from inside the house. She was like, what happened? And I was like, oh, I put a hole through my speaker. She was like, what? And I was like, you don't understand. She was worried about you. You're like, yeah. no, I'd rather put this stupid yeah. screwdriver through my forearm yeah. than the speaker. <laughs> right. I just put a Band-Aid over me. You can't just put a Band-Aid over a speaker. So then yeah. I had to have Madison overnight me one for FedEx so I can get it installed. Like it, it, I had to do it like the next day. Oh. Yeah, that was rough. That was not cool. Um, kind of going back to your designs, though, I'll, I'll throw this out there. You know, I've kind of mentioned it to Eric and some of the other guys that if you ever have a design that you are kind of in the process of working on, just send it to me and I'll be happy to test it to you, test it for you. Uh, I mean, for no cost, you know, I'm not going to charge anything for it. And then just send you the data back and you can kind of use that to help work along some things if, if it will be useful to you. Yeah, no, that'd be cool. Um, I do live up in Canada, though. I know. So yeah, I know. An issue. But I do have family down in the States. Mm -hmm. And when they open this border, um, you know, I'd like to get down there and then shipping stuff around. That's how, usually how Eric and I would get um, stuff to me is uh, whenever I was down there visiting family, he'd just send it over. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the the offer is out there. Yeah, when, when you said that, uh, you know, you were, I think, two hours behind me, I was like, well, where? You know, I think you sent me your the city that you were in or something. I looked it up. I can't remember now. I didn't Whoa. realize that you were in Canada. I, yeah, I had no I idea. I, I always thought that you were like in Washington, and I have I have no idea why I thought that. But for some reason, I thought you were. Maybe I just associated the Pac Northwest or something, and and was not. Yeah, a lot of it. people will ask kind of where I'm from, and I'll say, oh, you know, Vancouver, and then I'll say the Pacific Northwest, yeah. right? Because a lot of Americans aren't sure exactly where I am. Yeah, but you know where the Pacific Northwest is, right. so. And then I believe there's a Vancouver, Washington. So uh, there's a Vancouver, Canada, a Vancouver Island, Canada, and a Vancouver, <laughs> Washington. So that doesn't help think, at all. Yeah, and I visit Washington a lot too. So somewhere along there, that's where you got that idea. Yeah, maybe so. I appreciate you saving me there because I mean, people could have just thought I was stupid, but you helped you build me out of that, and I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> this guy doesn't know his states or his that. countries and all that. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we were going to try to keep it somewhat light and keep it informal. So uh, if there's anything you want to talk about or, or say, then I'll, I'll let you do that. And, and if not, maybe we can we can end this and I'll definitely keep in touch with you otherwise. Yeah, I don't know if there's anything about the 1099 you want to fill in any holes in your review or whatever. But I mean, if something comes up, you can always email me. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, now I know. Well, I, I guess I will ask you or, or mention I was unsure of where the design axis was. I mean, some, most of the time, you know, if it's a tweeter, it's at the tweeter. And then when it's a wave guide and a wolfer, it's kind of in between. Um, so the fellow that brought them over from his house, he helped me lift it up on the stand because the stand's about four and a half feet off the ground. And we just kind of looked at it and said, well, <clears throat> excuse me, it's probably in between, you know, the wave guide and the mid ranges. So I put it, you know, I just kind of took a guess and I thought, well, the clipple allows you to, after it measures it, you can go through and change your reference point. So that's cool. But it happened to nail, we, we just got lucky because it nailed the reference point perfectly. And I was like, all right. So for what it's worth, it's like right below or, or right on line with the bottom of the waveguide. And I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah, so I saw that in the review and I just assumed that maybe you um, grabbed that off my FAQ or something because most reviewers will just measure on the tweeter axis. Yeah. And um yeah, it's it's mostly centered between the waveguide and the woofers or mids. Mm -hmm. um, the funny thing about design axes, I mean, a good speaker should have a fairly broad vertical window to mm -hmm. sit in. When you move the microphone really close, like a meter away, it can become a bit of an issue, especially with such a tall speaker. I'm right. not sure how far away you measure from, but mm -hmm. um, if you're three meters back on your couch, the listener shouldn't get too concerned if their ear is, you know, slightly below the mids or slightly above the tweeter. Um, yes, in this case, the the listening axis is roughly between the two, but mm -hmm. there should be enough of um, a front lobe there that they can listen in there. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of had a train of thought there that I lost, but... Anyway. I do that all the time, man. I do yeah. that all the time. Yeah. Oh, so for what it's worth, the the, the measurement system that I use, it, it measures stuff in, in what it calls the near field. And the near field, as you know, can be 
you know, different distances depending on the size of the speaker and the, you know, the, I guess the makeup of it, you know, the number of drive units it has and all that. So, uh, and then it extrapolates near field data to far field data. So you can basically go from as close physically as you place the microphone to, I mean, I don't know, like hundreds of meters out, I guess, theoretically, if you wanted to, it uses crazy math. Uh, I actually spoke with one of the engineers who designed it. He wrote his master's thesis on the math that goes on uh, behind it. Um, so saying all that, you know, I, I measure in the near field, but I extrapolate the data out. And by default, the CEA 2034 standard is two meters um, distance, but then it pulls it back into one meter sensitivity. So even though the measurements, you know, state so-and-so at one meter, 2.83 at one meter, it's actually two meter distance. And at that point, I think I had actually found in the software that the far field, near field transition was I want to say it's like 1.4 or 1.5 meters. So for what it's worth, there you go. That's you got to be at least that far to have the speaker sum correctly. Yeah, and that sounds about right from what I remember with how far the woofers are spaced apart. Um, usually with these big speakers, I'll measure at two meters and then yeah. um, add six dB or whatever it is. I can't remember if it's three or six. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely. The other thing with the vertical window I should mention is for guys who are designing their own speakers, I don't know how many of your viewers are building these and how many are trying to design their own speakers, but I learned very early on that you, you know, you'll often flip the polarity of the tweeter and check for a reverse null. Yeah. Um, it's something that you learn to do kind of early on. And sometimes that thing won't be super deep. You know, everybody goes, Oh, look how deep this reverse null is. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, if you move your microphone, especially if you're only a meter away, if you move it up or down like 10 centimeters, you can see that null dramatically change. Hmm. Another thing you can do is slightly tweak, uh, you know, one of the first order components on the crossover and that null can dramatically change. And what's happening there is when they're out of polarity, their, their wavelengths back to physics, mm -hmm. they, um, they're canceling each other out. They're not going up and down together. They're, they're going away from each other and then crossing. Mm -hmm. And if you move your microphone up and down, that's changing the distance. So now if they're only slightly out, out of phase, when you move the microphone, you put them completely out of phase, 100 degrees out of phase, 180 degrees. So sorry if this is getting too technical. No, but no, actually, no, this is what I live for, man. So for the people trying to design their own speakers, Please don't get too hung up on that. You'll see that on Facebook forums and things like that, that, you know, you got to have a deep reverse null. But really what's happening there is that bulb of in-phase sound in front of the speaker is just moving up and down ever so slightly. Right. And you can play with that with your crossover components. You can play with that with your ear position. You can play with that with tilting your speakers front and back. There's a lot of things you can do. And it's really, I think, something that, as a newbie, you go, oh, I got to have that, but don't worry about that so much. <laughs> right. So I think what you're saying is you're talking about the, the front lobe and you may be above or below that front lobe when you're taking the initial measurement. And maybe, right. it, maybe it would be good to kind of move the microphone a little bit up and down just to make sure as a sanity check, I guess, to make sure that you're measuring from the right point in space as well. Yeah. And if you measure a front lobe, like you'll, like if you do a vertical measurement, which I do for a lot of my speakers on my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. you'll see a front lobe kind of appear. You'll right. see nulls show up above and below the axis. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that front null will, will kind of be bulbed up or sometimes it'll be bulbed down. Yeah. And ideally it's bulbed out in front. Right. But usually what happens if that null is, you know, 10 dB deep instead of 20, that's only like maybe a five degree difference. So your speaker, your front lobe might point up five degrees. Well, if you put your speaker down close to the floor and listen kind of above axis, that might be perfect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a good point. Something to think about a little bit technical, but maybe for some of the new speaker designers out there, I, you know, shoot me a message if you want a video about that or something, but it's something to not, I see it all the time. People get really worked up about reverse nulls and, <laughs> and don't, and it's all related to that listening position. Like you were asking yeah. about where the, where the design axis is. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting too. I mean, for people who are wondering just out of pure curiosity, you're, you're basically talking about array steering, you know, phased array steering in a sense. And then to go like the next 
far step, that's how a lot of radars work. You know, it's kind of like they, they're shifting the, the radiation pattern, the lobing pattern, and they're using different uh, radiation devices, you know, to cancel out the beams, and they do beam steering that way. So it's really interesting how you can take, you know, acoustic stuff and apply it to things that are out there in the real world, like military devices, and think, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, wow. You know, we're nerding out a little bit, but yeah. you know, that, that, that's good information. Um, do you do, so I know you do a lot of quasi um, anechoic measurements. You put up the, the microphone, not the microphone, the speaker off the ground. And I'm trying to remember, I know I've seen you get on the ladder, right? Yep. And about how high up are you just, you know, to help people kind of understand what your measurement process is. Yeah. So this is another thing good for new speaker designers. Um, you're often tempted to stay inside your house. And you need to be as far away from reflections as you can be, unless you have a very advanced software like a couple. Um, so the further, the better. Um, the further away, the lower um, simple software like Rue can measure uh, accurately, mm -hmm. but not just accurately, but also the resolution. So if you Bingo. want, yes, yes, yes. If you want to measure your speaker, say to 300 hertz and up you can do that in your house a small speaker you can put that kind of center between ceiling and floor take a measurement and technically you're measuring from 300 hertz and up but you're going to have about two data points between 300 and 600 hertz mm -hmm. almost useless right when i go outside and i I'll, I'll use like an eight foot ladder and maybe even a stand on top of that and i'll measure a meter away or on a big speaker a couple meters away I can usually measure from at least a hundred Hertz and up sometimes even, especially if I'm only a meter away, I can measure from 60, 70 Hertz and up with really good resolution from about 200 Hertz and up. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's sorry for the long answer, but yeah, about, no, about 10 feet, in, 10 feet in the air is what that's I'm kind of looking for. Yeah, that's a good answer. And I really like the fact that you, cause I, I swear, I don't know how many times I go over the same thing. People will say, well, I've gated my measurement down to 300 hertz, and then they'll then they'll say, and they and then I only smoothed it, or I did no smoothing, I only smoothed it to 124 or 148, and I'm like, but your data doesn't even have that resolution. Your data has like one yeah. third resolution because if it's 300 hertz and you've got a data point at three, six, 900, 1200, I mean, essentially, you know, like every 300 hertz is where you've got a good data point. So your data is smooth by default. Totally. And yeah. it, it gets even worse sometimes where you see people that have the gate set around four or 500 hertz. And they're trying to do, say, a thousand or twelve hundred hertz crossover. Oh yeah. You just can't do it. Yeah, you don't I have mean, the data points to do that with. You don't have the like, resolution. You can, but yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't. But, but not well. You're yeah. not doing it well. So go outside, do it properly. If you want to, unless you're crossing over um, above, like a four thousand hertz crossover or something, go ahead and do that inside. Otherwise, get outside. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you making that point strike home because I swear it's something that drives me nuts. I, I can't tell you the number of times when I see, Oh, I've got gated to three or four milliseconds, but I had no smoothing. I'm like, yeah, your data smooth. Your by default, your data smooth. Yeah. So yes, it is smooth. Um, I had that, to learn that the point. hard way too. Oh, I did too. I mean, I, the number yeah. of times that I've measured something and you know, you just, a lot of this stuff isn't intuitive, at least for me, you know, and then you do it and you look at the data and you're trying to make sense of it. And then you go back and, and look at something else. You read something else and something just kind of clicks, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I get it now. And, and my measurements are the same way. I actually went out and bought and the name escapes me of what these dang things are called, but it's like, you know, you, you it's got four big caster wheels. You stand on it to do like drywall or painting, you know, a big metal oh, yeah. thing with the platform on it. My, I don't know why the name it starts with a C. I think my mind has just gone blank on me. But I went to one of uh, what we call, have here in the States, and I don't know if you've got on the Harbor Freight. Yep. Okay. We don't have them, but I know what they are. Okay. Yeah. So I, I went and bought one of those. I think it's paid like maybe 200 bucks. And I basically locked three wheels and kept one wheel free. Or I'm sorry. I locked one wheel, kept three wheels free. And then I can put the speaker up on top of that, and then I can rotate it about a center point. And that yes. worked well for me. That got the speaker up about six feet off the ground. Um, which was enough to get me down to, I think I, I called it quits at like four or 500 Hertz. I mean, good data down to that far. And then I use ground plane to kind of stitch the rest of it in. But yeah. even doing that isn't without problems because I mean, I, I did a whole thing on ground plane measurements. Like a, I'd even call it a study, if you will, where I thought, 
you know, can I put it on plywood? Take it in the backyard, put it on plywood. Well, no, that doesn't work. Can you put it on just regular grass? Well, no, that doesn't work. Because at some point, you know, like two, three, four, five hundred 500 hertz, the data is corrupt, you know, from whatever it's on. And I learned the hard way that you've really got to, you really just need a huge parking lot. You know, if you want high accurate data up to at least 1K, you and you've got to make sure you tilt it right. You know, you've got to go through all that extra step. And then you really need to have the off ground measurement to match up just to make sure that it, it makes sense. You know, it's a big pain in the butt. Really, it, it is. is. It really is. Sometimes I find the best option when you are measuring a complete speaker is to put it high up on a ladder and not bother merging a ground plane or a near field or anything, just measuring that thing completely raw, no gate or anything, mm -hmm. and just having a good look at the data and kind of smoothing it out by eye and going, okay, you know what? There's my ground reflection right there. If mm -hmm. I'm 10 feet high, that's corresponding to, I think, close to 10 milliseconds. Yeah, yeah, so, something like that. Yeah. yeah, so boom, 10 milliseconds. There it is again, there it is again. And you can kind of almost, when you get good enough at it, you can see your base roll off and everything in there. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I have, I don't publish those kinds of responses, but sometimes I use them more than anything. Yeah, and it's probably a lot easier and it's probably more efficient when you get to the point, like you said, where you just, you get to a point where you can realize, you can see through the data, you know, through the yeah. bad, the reflections and things like that. So yeah, that's really good information. I think a lot of people might find that useful from you. So I appreciate that. Right on. Well, cool. Well, all right, dude, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know you got projects to work on, like some clip ceiling speakers. I can't believe <laughs> I'm talking to you about ceiling speakers. You're going to love it when I show you. <laughs> I hope you see that video and you'll be laughing when you it. see the, the quality of that thing. It's just yeah. so cheesy. Yeah, no, I'll watch it. Yeah, because I was like, where did this guy go? He just quit making videos. And, I, and, I, and not to be more, but I was like, I hope he's all right. <laughs> I've had people ask. Yeah, they're yeah. like, I hope you're okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Well, I'm glad you're still around. And once again, man, I appreciate you joining me and coming to hang out and explain a little bit about what you did with the 1099 and, and all your other stuff, man. I think a lot of people will really appreciate that information as well. Right on. Thanks, Aaron. And good to kind of meet you. Yeah. That, that, and for anybody who was wondering, Ron and I have literally never talked until we started this stream. No, no, yeah. nothing other than Facebook messages saying, hey, would you want to join the stream? And he said, sure. So yeah, this is cool. And it, it seems like it went well. You seem like a really, really cool dude. And uh, anything I can do to help you with any of your future designs, just, just let me know. Uh, same goes for me. Appreciate uh, it. Yeah, man. Well, all right. Well, I'll talk to you later, dude. You too. All right. Later. Bye.